Turn with me to Luke. Let's take your Bibles and go to Luke. Uh, Mountain Dew, that's in, uh, where's that found? In First Balonians? <laughs> First Balonians, yes. So anyway, if you got your Bibles, let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. God's prophetic plan is always on schedule. Amen. You know what I'm saying? God is never late. He is always on time, right? Amen. I mean, have you found that to be true in your life? That, that God is always on time? I mean, there are times that we push him because we have a certain timetable we want him to meet. Amen? Come on, it's true. We push God. We said, no, I need it now, not later. And so we push the envelope and we, we tell God what the time is supposed to be. But there are periods of time that we witness that seem to be faster than others. And then there are seemingly times of slower paced times. And the Bible gives us an example of a slow time in the scripture when he talks about Israel being in captivity for 400 years. Think about that. Could you imagine God being silent from you for 400 years? I can't handle it for a day if God doesn't talk to me. Could you imagine 400 years of not hearing from him? Better yet, could you imagine going a whole week not hearing from God? I'd be pulling my hair out by this point. And it's already thin. So I couldn't afford to do that. Me and Lydia were talking about that yesterday. She talked to us and said, have you thought about Bosley? What is Bosley? Well, you know, they put those hair plugs in, you know, and help your hair to grow. I'm like, I don't need any help. Because be my luck, they'd do that and everything would fall out. <laughs> then I'd be stuck with these plugs that look like a mohawk running down my head. And then there are examples of swift fulfillment in the scriptures, like the deliverance of Egypt and the time in the birth of Christ in this present time because we come on if you face it we all live in a face past society everything is happening all the time just as fast as fast food you go you used to have to make an appointment to get your oil changed in your car now you just drive up to one of those little shacks they throw it up on the lift to change your oil and you're out in five minutes you know everything is becoming so fast paced everything is such a rush and you know what People are even rushing God. People are taking five minutes for their devotional time. Okay, I have my devotion. I got to go. Some people have a set schedule for their devotions. Did you know that? I right, from, from 7.45 to 7.50, I have my devotion. Don't interrupt me. Five minutes. I, you know, God understands I'm really busy. He knows I've, I've got to go. But we can sit in front of a television and watch a 30-minute program and not think anything about it. Not think one moment about how much time we spent watching a, a television program, or even an hour. But yet we can only give God five minutes when it comes to our devotional time. In Luke chapter 1, verse 5, there was in the day of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacchaeus, or Zacharias, I'm sorry, of the course of Ahab. And his wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both now well stricken in years. They were old. I just hate, you know, I just read that sometimes. I'm thinking, you know, why did they have to point that out? Why did they have to point out they were old? You know, it, it makes me think of myself. I'm old. You know. But this is, this is what's recorded. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, 
according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without, without a time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah saw him and was troubled, and fear fell on him. But the angel of the Lord said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Even from his mother's womb. When you think about that, think about that for a moment. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Even in the womb. They're going to have joy. They're going to have, wow. They're going to have a baby. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elisha to turn the hearts of the fathers of the children and their disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you, Lord God, is this passage of scripture that you've given us prepares a preparation for Christ the Lord. Lord, I pray this morning, may these words this morning speak to our hearts. May we, Father, be obedient children to you, worshiping you, keeping your word, head deep, keeping your word hid deep within our hearts that we would not sin against you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we see here now in verse 7, they had no child. We see two people who are stricken in years old, and they have no child. So here comes this angel who appears to him in the temple. He's troubled because nobody's supposed to be there. Remember, when the priest went into the Holy of Holies, they tied a rope around him when he went in. In case he should fall dead, they had to drag him out. Because nobody, isn't that terrible? Could you imagine all of you come into church this morning with a rope tied around you? In case the Lord would just strike you dead. And then we could have to pull you back out. Because who would want to come in? People would be scared. They'd be uptight. My concern is who would pull me out because my loved ones are already here. <laughs> I guess I'm just stuck. But that's Okay. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? So, hey, you, know, you can come pick up the carcass if you want. The Spirit's with the Lord. But Elizabeth was barren. They were both now stricken. And only a few verses after, after we see them, where, where, where we become aware of this one thing. This must have been a paramount thought in their life. Think about this. They've gone their whole life, no children. And I can't imagine her, or any woman for that matter, pretty much, not wanting to have children. Because God created us to what? To multiply. He gives you a, a wife, a husband, a wife, and a wife, a husband, and, 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 and they're, they're, they're the what? They're to populate the earth. You know, I hear a lot of people today say, well, I don't, I don't want to bring a child into this world today. It's cruel and it's corrupt. But then you're, you're disobeying the word of God. Because the word of God says that we, we have an obligation. If, can you imagine? Think about this for a second. Think about if all the young Christian ladies that are coming up in the church today decided to stop having children. Think about that for a moment. The church would not exist anymore. 
Why? Because when they get older and they can't have children, their children that they could have had aren't going to be coming up in the fear of the Lord. So therefore, the, the, the population of Christianity will di- dissipate. It will go away because there would be nobody else to share the gospel. Amen? So therefore, not only are we supposed to have children, but we're supposed to share the gospel. Now, I don't know about you, but the scripture tells me I'm God's child. I'm a child of the king. So therefore, I have an obligation to my father. And my father says that I'm to go into the highways and the byways, and I'm to compel them to come in. So therefore, what is he telling me? I am to go out and I am to spread the gospel. You know what the exciting thing about this portion of scripture is? They're going to have a child who's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. He is going to what? Turn the children. They're going to turn the people to the Lord. They're going to have an evangelist. Oh boy, we've got to start over. They're going to have an evangelist. His name is going to be John. He's going to prepare the way of the Lord. So, They've been given a great gift. All of us, even today, have been given a great gift. And we're, what are we to do with the gift? We're to prepare away the Lord. We're to bring people to the cross. Others knew of their problem. But nothing can be done about it. But see, nothing is impossible for God. Nothing. What, what did the angel say to him? I have heard your prayers. God has heard their prayers. And now he's going to give them a child. Now I know Elizabeth was a little shaken. She chuckled a little. <laughs> My husband has lost his marbles. He thinks I'm going to have a baby. Could you imagine? They were good people. They were good people, but perhaps your burden escapes all of your blessings. See, you have come today with something heavy on your heart. But yet you kind of say God can't do anything about it. Zachariah and Elizabeth, I'm sure, went their whole life saying, well, there's nothing we can do about it. We can't have any children. There's nothing we can do about it. But did they ever take it to the Lord? You see, the advantage, church, that we have today that he didn't have then is is they didn't understand what it was that we could take our problems to the Lord. We're to take our burdens to the Lord. And what are we to do? We're to leave them there. But the problem is we keep having more burdens because we keep taking them back with us. We say we leave them, but I'm going to tell you this. It's like that devotional life that you're having for five minutes. You leave that burden with the Lord for five minutes. It hasn't solved, so you take it back with you. That's what happens. And so, the great promise here lies in verses 8 to 11. And it came to pass that while he executed the the priest's office before God in the order of course, what according to the custom of the priest's office, he was going to light the incense. And he goes in and there's an angel standing there. Today, the answer to their prayer is, came the the answer came to them no matter what you're facing church no matter what your situation may be no matter what answer you're looking for it's on the way because God has heard your prayer he heard the prayer of 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 Elijah and, and Elizabeth or Zechariah and Elizabeth, he heard their prayer. And the prayer is going to be answered. You know, you know what the problem is sometimes with our prayer life? 
You know what sometimes the problem is when we, when we get the answer to the prayer and we don't quite like the answer? We forget that God's will is greater than our own. See, we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't serve you. You see that we have to get that 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 thought into a process. We have to get that all into this this up here. You see, God wants to do great things in you, but he wants his will to be done, not my will be done. You see and 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 some of us don't like God's will. What, pastor? Is that possible? Absolutely. There are people professing to be Christians all over the world who think that their will is what needs to be satisfied. Their will is what needs to be done. God needs to work around them, just like you need God to work around your devotional time. Your time that you're spending with Him. You think, well, God understands them, but but He needs to work around me. It doesn't work like that. Then we wonder why we got all the troubles that we have. We have these problems because we're trying to get God to work around us. Today, the longing and those two would be satisfied. The desire of their heart was going to be filled, they were going to have a child. When you begin to think about that day, when you begin to read the passage of Scripture we just read, it was an ordinary day preceded by an ordinary yesterday. They carried out their ordinary duties. Zacharias went to the temple as usual. It was a day of prayer. This is what they did. They were continually following in the footsteps that they had always followed, continued to do the things they always did. Church, if you're serving Jesus Christ, you have God on your heart all the time. You're meditating on Him day and night. You can have the same schedule and know that God is still going to talk to you. Know that God is still hearing your prayers. Knowing God is still walking with you. He's still with you. He says he will never leave you nor forsake you. He's going to carry us through. He's going to walk with us just as he did them. I begin to think about that. And I begin to think about some other passages of scripture. Of other burdens that were lifted in the day of the Bible. I begin to think about blind Bartimaeus when he was outside of Jericho. You remember the story? We don't know how long he was blind, but it only took a matter of moments for him to decide to call upon Jesus for help. And what did that help do? Just think, they tried to hush him, remember? Be quiet, be quiet. You know, yeah, he doesn't want to be troubled with you. But no, he didn't let the crowd stop him. He continued to call upon the name of the Lord. Unlike today, if we mention Jesus' name, people hush us. Shh, you're in the workplace. You can't talk about Jesus here. You're at a restaurant. You're with mixed company. You can't talk about religion there. You're in your own home having Christmas or a birthday or Thanksgiving. And there's, they, they tell you on the news and they, all these great counselors tell you well there's three things you should never talk about when you're in workplace party or you're at home with mixed company or you have guests over you should never talk about politics and you should never talk about religion i disagree i want people to know i'm a republican no i want people to know who i serve jesus christ I'm going to share Jesus in my home. And I'm going to share Jesus in my workplace if I have the opportunity. I'm going to share Jesus in the restaurant if I have the opportunity. And it presents itself. I'm sure going to do it. I do it in the grocery store. People know I love Jesus because I tell them that Jesus loves them. 
There's the opportunity, church. There's the opportunity. We're missing the opportunities. We're, we're allowing the world to push us back. And we're taking the push. Oh, yeah, I guess I really shouldn't say that. I guess I shouldn't do this or I shouldn't do that. No. You need to stand up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to stand up for your Savior. I, and look, well, you don't, you don't know how I'm going to be treated. Well, how did they treat Jesus? They hung him to a cross. But we're worried about getting our feelings hurt. I've grown to have some pretty heavy leather shoulders because of what people say. But it's like I said last week. It doesn't matter what people think about Jesus. He still loves them anyway. And the world needs to know that. But we see that through blind Bartimaeus and and how he was touched, we began to think about Zacchaeus. Remember the little Jewish guy who was a tax collector? Remember the Romans? They, They always collected the taxes and the taxes were pretty heavy. We whine about our taxes today. Let's go back to then and talk about tax day. Because see, their tax day wasn't just once a year. Their tax day was every quarter. How would you like to pay taxes every quarter? And they were pretty heavy. But Zacchaeus, he heard about this Jesus. He wanted to see him, so he gets up in this tree. And when Jesus comes by, he says, come down, I'm going to your house today. And man, what a life-changing experience he had. And then you begin to think about the Samaritan woman at the well. Look at her life-changing experience. All three of these, just these, just these three, there are many more. But think of these three people that had a life-changing experience because they had an encounter with the Savior. We should have life-changing encounters every day. We should have new experiences every day. You see, when their burden was lifted, their blessings were far greater than they ever expected. When I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, things got better. I'm not saying times got better, but things in my life got better. Things in my heart got better. Did I still have challenges? Absolutely. Did I stumble? Absolutely. Did I become a millionaire overnight? Absolutely not. Did I still have struggles? Absolutely. But I've always found this. I've always found this to be true. Jesus has always showed up. Never in my timing, never in my timing, but always in his. That's what we, that's, that's the hope that the baby Jesus brought us. That's the hope that he brought us, that, that things were going to change. Their baby brought hope to the world because he was going to share with the world. But the greatest thing that I think about that when I begin to think about their baby that came, when I think about John who came, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Church, we should be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what gives us the boldness to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to share Jesus with the world. It's the hope, not my Mountain Dew. That just gives me a little juice to get going. One whom they they had this baby, one whom they could show their love to, one whom they could see themselves in. I remember when we had Chelsea as a baby, and we'd go to somebody's house or we'd go to church. You know what I'd always hear people say? Who do you think she looks like? Her mother or her father? Oh, she's got her father's nose and her mother's eyes. Or, or oh, she's got her mother's lips or something like that, you know? And I'm thinking, and I'm looking at her. And I look at myself in the mirror. I'd look at her again. 
I look back at them and say, she looks like herself. Jesus has made her different. Jesus didn't make her like me and didn't make her like her mama. Jesus made her in his image. In his likeness. Jesus made all of you in his likeness. So you're beautiful. You're beautiful because Jesus don't make no junk. I don't, I don't know if you can say that kind of stuff from the pulpit, but we just did. I don't even know if that verbiage is correct, but that's how it came out. Those of you who are watching this morning, I apologize if it didn't sound right. That's how we roll here. God gave them a child, not just any child church, it's a child that we still talk about today. We still talk about John the Baptist today. He's a man who's remembered. When people die today, we don't remember them anymore. After a few years, they're gone. Who's that? Who? Who? Who's that? Yeah, oh, you know, oh, they died a few years ago. Oh, oh, that person. Seemingly, we seem to forget the people that were most important to our lives. But Jesus is departed from this earth over 2,000 years ago, but we have not forgot him. See, church, you can forget about everybody you want to forget about, but there's one person I'm telling you, you don't ever forget, and that's Jesus. Why? Because he has done the most for your life than anyone else. He's done more for you than your mother and your father, your grandmother and your grandfather. Jesus has given you eternal life, something nobody else can give you. There's a name above all names. And that's the name that we need to dwell on. John was, was, was good for his time. Matter of fact, he was even telling people that there was coming one who he was not even worthy to tie his sandals. But yet Jesus came to him to be baptized. Remember, he didn't want to do that. Remember that? But he did. You see, church, John had a calling from birth. While he was in the womb, he had a calling. All of us, church, have a calling. Once we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have a calling. And that calling is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, to tell everybody about the birth of Jesus. You know, we got this beautiful, I know I've just walked off scene, but this beautiful manger scene. And when we look at it, we see the, the baby Jesus in there with, with Mary and, and Joseph at their side. And we think about the, the shepherds, how the shepherds were called and they came rushing to the manger to see this great thing that the angels had told them about, the birth of Jesus. But before Jesus ever showed up, John was already preparing a way for the Lord. John was already changing hearts, out there speaking for hearts to be changed and transformed. He was the forerunner of Christ. Church, what are we doing? What are we doing about preparing a way for the Lord? Where are our lives today? What is going on in our life that we aren't taking the opportunities that are given to us every day to share Jesus Christ with others? John was beheaded. When you think about our lives, we're coming into a day and an age where if you mention Jesus' name in another country, you could be beheaded. They'd be holding you up. Let you look at the camera without your body. But it doesn't stop them from sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, our Savior is worthy to be praised, but our Savior is worthy to be shared.
these two were given an incredible gift. A child who would prepare a way for the Lord. Church, we've been given the same opportunity. We've been given the same gift. We already have the gift. Jesus has already come and he's already died for your sins. He's made it easier for you. But what are we doing about sharing it? What are we doing this Christmas season about sharing the baby Jesus? That's something we need to ponder. Something we need to think about when we get in the midst of other people. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that this story of Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth could impact our hearts. Lord, they yearned for a baby and you gave them one. Lord, they're are people in the world today who are yearning for Jesus. But nobody's sharing them with them. Lord, let us be the ones to start, to start sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who don't know. Lord, let this be a different Christmas season for the body of Christ. Not just this church, but the whole body as a whole. Lord, because it's not just Victory Fellowship, but Lord, it's legacy and, and it's other churches, Lord, that believe in you. Let us start sharing the gospel of Jesus. Let us share the gospel with the world. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for these things that we ask today in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, amen. amen and amen. Let's stand together.